Ministry of Music is by Ellie Purvis, assisted by Christina Purvis, and so at this time we will uh, be ministered to by the Holy Spirit through these two sisters. Once again, it's wonderful to be here with you this morning on this November 20th service. Uh, the theme is Give Thanks in All Things. 
Will Job did a wonderful job of bringing this theme out in the early, early worship. Uh, last night, here at the uh, gathering place, we had a wonderful Thanksgiving dinner. I think most of you were, were here, and uh, it was great to be together with our brothers and sisters as we uh, prepared for this Thanksgiving season that we're in couple of announcements. Uh, I think you're aware there will be no services this evening. Uh, the Center Place of Zion weekend was last evening, 6 o'clock, for a wonderful couple of hours, and then this entire morning. Uh, do encourage your attendance at the midweek services, Blue Springs facility, 6.30 uh, prayer service and and also at Bountiful. We've been having wonderful services and uh, would encourage you to attend. Uh, we can all be look, looking forward to the hastening times coming out this week, both electronic and hard copies. So be, be looking for that. I know you'll want to look over that uh, hastening times carefully. Uh, and I, I do want to mention Dick Trimble down here right behind David Lute, an old family friend, knew Dick and his family, his wife Marge, uh, in Grand Junction, Colorado in the 50s and 60s, and now uh, Dick is here in the Kansas City area. I look forward to visiting with you, Dick, and I would encourage each of you to visit with Dick Trimble. Uh, nephew of Houston Hobart, which most of us knew Houston Hobart. And so, anyway, it's good to be with each one of you, my brothers and sisters, this morning. Uh, we will have another Ministry of Music by Allie Purvis and Christina Purvis here uh, after the offertory by Bishop Elbert Rogers. Prior to that, our President Prophet Terry Patience will bring the invocation following the singing of 597. Uh, our sermon this morning is by High Priest Austin Purvis. As I said, he's a, he's a high priest. He's a long-standing member of the Standing High Council. He's been a pastor out at, uh, at Bountiful. He's presently counselor to the pastor, his brother Sean, at the Bountiful Congregation. He's the son-in-law of the presiding patriarch of the church. He's an educator, uh, specifically a principal at Hardin Central. Uh, he's a father, husband, and most importantly, a servant of the Most High God. And I look forward with you to the ministry brought to us this morning by High Priest Austin Purvis. Let us uh, be called to worship with the reading of Mosiah chapter 11, about three verses that I, I enjoy these three verses very much, and it speaks to us here at this Thanksgiving season. And they of the church began to have peace and to prosper exceedingly in the affairs of the church, walking circumspectly before God, receiving many and baptizing many. And now all these things did Alma and his fellow laborers do, who were over the church, walking in all diligence, teaching the word of God in all things, suffering all manner of afflictions. Can you imagine somebody doing the Lord's work and suffering all manner of afflictions? Well, they were doing that in 120 B.C., being persecuted by all those who did not belong to the church of God. Well, we're seeing more and more of that, uh, I believe, in 2022. And they did admonish their brethren, and they were also admonished, everyone, by the word of God, according to his sins or to the sins which he had committed, being commanded of God to pray without ceasing and to give thanks in all things. Let us continue by singing of 597 followed by the invocation by President 
Terry Patience. And by the way, I did not mention that the closing prayer at the end of the service will be by President David Van Fleet. 597. God, the Eternal Father, we do indeed come to you this morning giving thee thanks. For we know that you have blessed the lives of each and every one of us. For you have guided us, you have loved us, you have cared for us, you have shown us mercy. You have provided for us the air we breathe, the food we eat the nourishment of the spirit that is constantly with us. I would ask, Father, that uh, your spirit might continue to bless us, that you would work with our minds, that we might be able to be indeed in tune with your spirit, to hear you, and most of all at this particular time, to be able to worship you for all that you have done. For if we contemplate the majesty that you are and how you have blessed us, we can do nothing but say thank you and praise you. Be with all of us who are participating in this service, for we know that your spirit has been with us to guide us and direct us in that which we would do this morning. That this service would become more than just a gathering of people but a chance to truly worship and contemplate and to leave knowing that you are God, the God that leads and guides. And I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. As a bishop, uh, normally we expect someone to uh, stand here and really get to your hearts to uh, uh, make you a liberal giver. 
Uh, today I have a homework assignment for you to give time to our brother. I'm not going to go into a dissertation of scriptures that are my favorite regarding the offertory. I want you to write this down and read this when you get home. Matthew 25, verses 15 through 47, and Luke 18, verses 12 through 26. And just to give you a hint, that is about the ten talents. There's so many things that uh, have touched my heart through the years of uh, uh, what it is that we uh, are required of to give to the Lord. We know that it's a, a return of what God has already given to us, and we should have surplus in our lives. Uh, and the, the Book of Mormon touches very good on it in that uh, he that had plentiful gave more plentiful, and he that had sparingly gave sparingly. So where do we put ourselves in that category? That's each one of us, our opportunity and our responsibility to, to uh, know in our lives. May we pray. Our dear Father, we, uh, we come before you this uh, wonderful day of uh, thanksgiving. Thankful, Father, for the blessings of life. Thankful for the blessing of the ability to breathe, Father. The ability to look out on the beauty that you have created for us to enjoy the perfect artwork that you have. The many animals and flowers and the, the joy, Father, that uh, the children give to our lives. What a wonderful provider you are, Father. And we are indebted unto you. I would ask, Father, that as we uh, give this day, that we would search within our hearts to, uh, to know that which uh, is required of each one of us, that we might uh, be a blessing to your church for the, uh, uh, the utilities and uh, the expenses, Father, that are required to keep a building such as this in operation, as well as uh, the missionary outreach. So, Father, be with us. Bless us as we give, and that uh, it might be acceptable before you. And bless those hands, Father, that have care of it to uh, use it wisely. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning, brothers and sisters. I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Before I read my scriptures this morning, uh, I want to thank uh, my dear wife and uh, my sister-in-law, uh, Sister Allie, there. Uh, much uh, better at musical talents than I am. And from time to time, I uh, am specific with them and ask them to uh, uh, perform certain pieces for me. And the song that uh, Allie's about ready to sing is called, I Shall Not Want. This song I heard several months ago, and it's by Audrey Assad. And it helped me to understand what's truly important in my life and what I should be praying for, and what I should be asking for, and what I should do in my own life to prepare myself to be with the Lord Jesus Christ and to bring people to him. So I want you to listen very closely to the words that are sung by uh, Sister Allie. My two scripture readings, one is from Doctrine and Covenants 148, and the other is from Psalms 69. I'll be reading from Doctrine and Covenants at first. Stand steadfast, my people, for the buffetings of Satan will attempt to thwart your efforts to prepare yourselves for my coming. But remember, remember, I am with you even to the end. Behold, I desire to come quickly. Prepare the bride for the marriage. Trim your lamps, sanctify yourselves, and be secure in the knowledge that my endowing power awaits your response. Thus saith the Spirit. And then from Psalm 69, verses 30 through 35. I will praise the name of God with a song, and I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or a bullock that hath horns and hooves. The humble shall see this and be glad, and your heart shall live that seek God. For the Lord heareth the poor and despises not his prisoners. Let the heavens and the earth praise him, the seas and everything that moveth therein. For God will save Zion and will build the cities of Judah, that they may dwell there and have it in possession."
from the fear of serving others and from the fear of death or trial and from the fear of humility I shall not want, no I shall not want, no I shall not want, when I taste your goodness, I shall not want, when I taste your goodness, I shall not want, I shall I want to thank uh, Brother Will Job and uh, Brother Eric Wilson this morning. I came in this morning uh, having a lot of doubts of what I prepared. Those brethren nailed it right on the head this morning for me. I appreciate it very much. Because we're going to talk about being thankful even through trials. And we're going to talk about our spiritual preparation. Over the last couple of years, the Lord has been pushing me to prepare. I'm going to be sharing a couple of testimonies here at first. <clears throat> and I'm sorry for the bountiful congregation because they've heard some of these testimonies before. But I want to relay to you the importance of being thankful, even though we go through trials. But when we say that we are thankful or grateful to the Lord, I think there's a response on our part because he is trying desperately to cause us to see the things in our lives that we need to change. And if we're thankful for that, we would respond to him and we would do and keep his commandments. This sermon is not one that I'm going to be trying to be judgmental towards you. This sermon is how the Lord's dealt with me and how he has tried and pleaded with me to change and to draw closer to him. So keep that in mind as we move forward this morning. I appreciated very much the scripture that uh, Brother Mike uh, uh, had for the call of worship. I want you to notice that in that scripture that in Mosiah that it says, and they began again to have peace and prosper exceedingly in the affairs of the church, walking circumpently before God, receiving many and baptizing many. And now all these things were did with all diligence, teaching the word of God in all things, suffering all manner of afflictions, being persecuted by all those who did not belong to the church of God. And they were thankful because the Lord was moving them forward. And so I want to share just a couple of testimonies to start because like I said, I, uh, this is the how the Lord has dealt with me and tr showed me grace and moving me forward. As Brother Mike said, I, uh, I work in Hardin Central as a principal, and I have about a half an hour drive to Hardin Central. The last three years, uh, I've had two young ones in my car going to preschool, and they go there full time. So usually my uh, drives are answering questions 
or listening to kids' songs or whatever it might be. But I don't get a lot of peace and quiet usually in the car ride. But there are from times to times when my children don't ride with me, and I get to do and, and just think and meditate, and I get to listen to the music I want to listen to, which is usually Christian music. But as I was heading home one day after probably a, a little bit harder day, <clears throat> the Lord had a conversation with me. And for about three to five minutes, he chastised me. He chastised me because I'm selfish. And he told me that. And immediately, if that has ever happened to you, you start to make excuses for yourself. Well, I, I'm trying to do my best. I've dedicated my life to these young people at school. I live a life of service. I started comparing myself to other people instead of comparing myself to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I do that, I fall short. I can't help but think of how <clears throat> Brother Jared felt when he was chastised for three hours for not coming before the Lord and praying. I don't know how he dealt with that, because mine only lasted about three minutes, and that's about all I could handle. But I knew I had some work to do. I had a lot of work to do. Here recently, I was working around Bountiful. Uh, I'm blessed to be able to work on that land, and my brother needed some help. And so I had gotten the tractor out, and I was mowing some things for him and, and getting some uh, wood chips from Sister Dawn, who she's always very graceful and, and, and lending some wood chips to people. And I was listening to some music, and the Lord spoke to my mind and told me, Now! Now is the time for extraordinary preparation. Not later. Don't have time to meditate about it. Now he was stressing to me. I believe one of the reasons why he's telling me that and telling us that is because here very soon we're going to have a, a wonderful opportunity in the holy sanctuary to come before him and worship. And if we want that worship to be, to be what we expect it to be, we must be about preparing now, giving him thanks for his grace, but moving forward in our preparation, that we might have the experience that would draw us closer to him and allow us to share the testimonies that will break the sins of people that are around us. So keep that in mind, because the Lord desires us to prepare our, ourselves for his coming. In the Doctrine and Covenants, if you do a word search, it mentions preparation over 50 times. 50 times. Just in the last sections alone, from 144 on, 144 on in the rem, remnant revelations, it's mentioned 16 times. Some of those are from Doctrine and Covenants 152. Remember, the time to prepare for Zion is now, and I desire to come quickly. From section 153, 4b, it says, You have been called in renewal to prepare for the coming of the bridegroom. Let it be so. And then this scripture from Doctrine and Covenants 148, 6b, it says, Stand steadfast, my people, for the buffetings of Satan will attempt to thwart you in your efforts to prepare yourselves for my coming. I allow myself so oftentimes to become distracted, to make excuses for myself. Even in that first testimony that I gave you when the Lord said to me that I was selfish and self-centered, 
I stood on that for probably over a year before I actually did something about it. Because I allowed myself to be distracted, or in other words, as the scripture says, thwarted. This scripture is important because we have to realize that there is a force out there that seeks to throw us off and thwart our efforts. Some of those things are outside of our control. Brother Will talked about that this morning and how we go through trials and tribulations. There's some of those things. I can think of a couple families, two or three families within our church that are going through some pretty grievous trials. And we should be about praying for them, talking with them, counseling them, supporting them, helping them. It was a few years ago, in fact, probably close to 20 years ago now, that I began to realize the spiritual forces that are surrounding us and desire to throw us off track and frustrate us. The testimony which I'm about to share is not one that I share very often. In fact, I hold it very closely to my heart. But I feel prompted to share it with you this morning. Because we need to realize that adversary is working very, very hard. And if we are not prepared to meet him, and by the grace of God overcome him, we will not. I was living with Brother Tyler It was before I got married. He had asked me since my brother had gotten married and kicked me out of his house. He invited me in, thank goodness, or I would have been on the street. But we had a pretty good situation. And I lived upstairs while he lived downstairs. And it was probably, we lived together probably about a year, I think. And I was going through some trials. There was a, as I think it's Brother uh, Paul says, there was a thorn in my side. And I was trying. I think of the map for Brother Eric gave us and how it zigzags all around. A lot of my life is a zigzag. But not during this time. I was trying. Oh, I was trying. But I couldn't get over it. <clears throat> and one night I bowed before my bed and I pleaded with the Lord to help me. And I went to bed. I was awakened in the middle of the night. And I was well aware of a presence in the room. And I saw an evil spirit. It's hard to explain. This whole person was dark. From the very edges all the way to the core. And I began to have a spiritual conversation with this person. And he was telling me that I was going to fail. Why are you trying? You can't do this. Do you ever feel like that? Do you ever feel like the whole world is crumbling upon you? Like you can't overcome And it's hard, so hard to give thanks in those times. Instead of rebuking the spirit, I didn't have the strength. I turned over and I went to bed. The next morning I got up and that spirit was still there. Oh, it was oppressive. I had gotten in the shower, getting ready for work or for school, I don't remember which. Now, Brothers Tyler's, his, the bathroom upstairs had a little space in between the door and the door jam. Brother Eddie probably remembers that. And you could see out into the room from taking a shower, because he used to live there too. And I was just sitting there, thinking, why am I even trying? 
It was at that moment that I saw a flash of light in the room. And I was let to know that there was an angel in the room fighting my battles. Because those battles I could not, because I was not strong enough, God in his mercy and his grace sent an angel to fight that battle for me. A scripture comes to mind here from Doctrine and Covenants 100. If you remember this scripture, this has to do with after uh, the saints were kicked out of the center place. And the Lord said this to Brother Joseph. Behold, I say unto you, the redemption of Zion must needs come by power. Therefore, I will raise up unto my people a man who shall lead them like as a Moses led the children of Israel. For at ye are the children of Israel. Did you hear that? Ye are the children of Israel. And with all that comes the power of God. Comes the power to overcome. If we will be thankful and respond to his grace and his love. Ye are the children of Israel and of the seed of Abraham, and ye must needs be let out of bondage by power, and with a stretched down arm. And as your fathers were led at the first, even so shall the redemption of Zion be. Therefore, let not your hearts faint. Don't let the trials get you down. Be grateful. Be thankful. And as your fathers were led at the first, even so shall the redemption of Zion be. Therefore, let not your hearts faint. For I say unto you, as I said unto your fathers, mine angels shall go up before you, but not my presence. But I say unto you, mine angels shall go before you, and also my presence and in the time he shall possess the goodly land. What a promise. Not quite sure if I can read something like that and then go find joy in watching football on a Sunday afternoon. There's some things outside of our control. And God will give his grace and his love to protect us and watch over us and give us the powers of heaven to overcome them. But sometimes, and probably far too many times in my life, those wounds are self-inflicted. Sometimes we just walk away and we have that zigzaggy line. Unfortunately, even in preparation, this is a simple testimony of what happened to me. I don't know if many of you are aware, I know there are some of you aware, that it's deer hunting season. It's pretty important in my life. Not the most important thing, but I like to be out in the timber. I like to be hunting. And I was asked, I don't know who it was, during deer hunting season to give a sermon. And I told myself, the Lord blessed me with, with uh, getting a deer during bow season. But I told myself, I told myself, I'm not going to hunt. I'm going to get ready for this sermon. My office faces my back timber. And so when I was preparing for this sermon, when I had already told myself that I wasn't going to hunt, 
even though if, you, if you're in my house, you'll notice that every other window just about has a screen taken off of it. The reason why is because if there's a rabbit out there or there's something out there and I want rabbit stew, I'm going to get that rabbit. But I told myself that I wasn't going to hunt. And I was surrounded by deer last Saturday on the opening day of deer season. And a couple nights, bucks came right through my backyard. And what's the first thing I did? I got my gun. Somebody said it. And I allowed myself to be distracted from what was truly important. Do you ever do that? Do you ever allow yourself to be tempted? Zion is way too important in our lives to be distracted. I have to do better. I have to be focused. I have to love the people of this world and my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ more than anything else. It's only through that type of dedication and being thankful will Zion come about. And that we will have those worshipful experiences that are needed in our lives to bring us closer to him. A story comes to mind here. You know it quite well. It's about Mary and Martha. Very close friends to Jesus. I'm going to read this just uh, from Luke chapter 10. Just to remind us of some of the things that were going on. And it came to pass as they went, Jesus and his disciples, they entered into a certain village. And a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had sisters called Mary, a sister called Mary, excuse me, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his words. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. She's a little bitter. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Let's put a little context into this story. Mary and Martha and the, their brother Lazarus, I'm sure you all remember Lazarus, whom Jesus raised from the dev, dead, lived together in Bethany, a small town in Judah near Jerusalem. They were faithful followers of Jesus, and Jesus loved them very much and resided with them when he came near to their city and town. I want you to keep in mind that this experience was near the end of Jesus' ministry on earth. It was most likely had grown dangerous to entertain Jesus, especially so near to Jerusalem. Yet Martha cared not what hazards may befall her for Jesus' namesake. And Martha invited Jesus into her home to dine with her family. I liked what Matthew Henry says in his commentary about uh, Mar Martha and Mary after Mary was hearing the words of Christ. Listen to these words. It seems our Lord Jesus, as soon as he came into Martha's house, addressed himself to his work of preaching the gospel. He never stopped. He never stopped. A good sermon is never the worse for being preached in a house. Since Christ is forward to speak, we should be swift to hear. Swift to hear and respond and obey. Mary sat, sat to hear, which denotes a close attention. Her mind was composed, and she resolved to, not to catch a word now and then, 
but to receive all that Christ delivered. If we sit with him at his feet now, we shall sit with him on his throne shortly. But Martha's response was not the best. She had responsibilities. We all have responsibilities, don't we? Sometimes there are a lot, and we get bogged down. But we can't forget. We cannot forget what truly is important. Martha had made a lot of good choices. She invited Jesus into her home, was very good friends. But even with that, Jesus, there was something there that Jesus wanted to address. Matthew Henry goes on and says, Martha was very much serving. Her heart was set upon it to have a very sumptuous and splendid entertainment for Jesus. She was in care concerning much attention, attendance. Martha was cumbered about it. She was just distracted with it. Whatever cares the providence of God casts upon us, we must not be cumbered with them. Care is good and duty also, but cumber is sin and folly. She was then cumbered about much serving when she should have been with her sister sitting at Christ's feet to hear his words. Jesus reproved Martha. So he was at this time her guest. He rebuked her because he loved her and wanted to take hold, wanted her to take hold of the best things. Not just the good things, the best things. And there's a difference we need to be aware of and subjectively look at our lives to make sure that we are always holding on and being thankful for the best things in life, the Christ-like things in our life, the righteous things in our lives, and not to become overcrowded. <clears throat> During a worship service, a Wednesday evening worship service, the person that was presiding read a message by Arthur Oakman from 1974. I have a, actually a copy here. I wish I had the time to read it for you. It's quite lengthy. I'm sure many of you probably have read it before. It's from Wichita, Kansas, when Arthur was there giving ministry. If, if you don't have it and would like to read it in full, I have it with me and would be uh, okay to give it to you. But during this sermon, or during this inspired message, the Lord used Brother Oakman to be very pointed for just a little while. And I'm glad he read it, because it caused me to think again about my preparation and what truly is important. Hear these words. I am the Lord your God. I am the same who spake to the Israelites on Mount Sinai in the thunderous times, and the people heard and knew my name. I am he who has spoken to you in the still small voice, given counsel and comfort many more times, and have blessed you. Yet many more times would I have blessed you, but ye would not hear me, and those blessings I have had to withhold. I have blessed you financially, and materially, yet ye have withheld your tithings and offerings. Ye have not attended prayer services as you have ought, where you could have gained strength from each other. You could have used, you used the excuse of complaining of body of weariness, much of this being caused by extra activities that you have undertaken in other interests of the world. Some have spent the evenings in other areas for financial gain, and there are those who have chosen to attend social organizations of this world and, have had, and I have had to withhold my blessings. Again, I want to remind you, this is not me being judgmental towards you. It's me being reflective on what truly is important in my life 
and how I need to make sure that I align what I desire to what Christ desires for my life and for yours. Why does God reprove us? There are many reasons. One of those reasons is to build up the kingdom of earth, or kingdom of God on earth. So that we might have eternal life and be in the presence of God the Father. And there are several others. But also it is because so we can see clearly enough to help the people around us. Have you ever been in a situation where somebody came to you with a problem and you had no idea how to help them? It's not a very good feeling, is it? Desire, God desires to use us, and we need to be close to him. Here recently, in the last couple of weeks in my preparation, <clears throat> I've had several people come to me and ask me questions. One of those is my superintendent. From time to time, he uh, comes to me and talks to me about, about church things. Uh, the last time, it was about the Godhead. But before he, a couple of years ago, he came to me and he was teasing me about my belief in the Book of Mormon. It doesn't bother me. He was teasing me and he goes, aren't you the people that lay the, the, the Bibles or the Book of Mormons in hotel rooms? Like, no, that's the Gideons. And I still to this day regret. I was going to take one of my missionary Book of Mormons and I was going to write it on a post-it note and said, place by the purvis and put it in his desk. <laughs> I still regret not doing that because I wanted to do that and I didn't and I should have. But just here this week, <clears throat> Somebody came to my office, and they were having troubles with their marriage. And she had gotten some bad counsel. And we talked just a little bit about what marriage is, about what it means, about how you are one flesh. And when you lose, your spouse loses. And when you win, your spouse wins and vice versa. And we had that conversation. But the interesting fact about this experience, my office is right next to the door, and I have a window so I could see the door, so I can see outside. And she was taking her children, and she was walking out the door. And for just a moment, just a split second in time, I saw into her life. I saw what she really needed. And I had the opportunity to pray for her under the inspiration of the Spirit. I'm sure that has happened to you on several occasions. And it needs to continue to happen on a wider and a deeper scale because then you know what they need in their life. You know how to counsel them. You know how to bring them closer to the Lord Jesus. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. And that's what it's going to take to build up this church to break the sins of those that we have come in contact with. Are we willing to make that type of preparation? Am I willing to make that type of preparation? It will take a sacrificial type of preparation. Several, spirit, spirit, or several scriptures talk about sacrifice. In Romans chapter 12, Paul says, I beseech you therefore, many of us have this memorized, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Jesus himself said this in John the 15th chapter, greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. 
God is, God's word is full of sacrificial offerings by both men and women. I would think of Peter and Andrew sacrificed all to follow Jesus at the Sea of Galilee. We have Hannah, the mother of Samuel, who gave her son to the service of the Lord. Can you imagine that? Barely being able to see your child, but giving it willingly. We have Alma, the older, leaving everything after he heard the preachings of the prophet Abinadi. And I would be amiss if I didn't mention Jesus and the sacrifice that he made. We can't look at the decisions these people made and just in a microcosm, just in a fraction of a second. There was a lot of preparation that went in to those decisions. A lot of prayer, a lot of fasting, obedience, an everyday choice, an everyday choice to follow God, which culminated in a decision to give up their all for the kingdom of God and for their Savior. I have one more testimony from, from work. It's important uh, that I share this because I think it's a choice that we make to serve. I would, was a first-year principal some eight years ago now, and I had a teacher who was struggling with some students and their behavior. Some of you are educators, know what I'm talking about. You struggle sometimes. And she was struggling. She had a, a child who had came uh, back to school who was at an alternative school for his behaviors. Unfortunately, they shut down that school, and we had to bring that child back. And a couple times he had thrown trash cans across the room, hit other kids. One time he'd sprinted out of the room, or sprinted out of the school, and we had to chase him down. It was a very good situation. I'm hesitant about telling you what exactly happened during that day because it, it was not pretty. It was not pretty. And so I went into her room to talk with her, to see how she was doing. And she was in tears, just crying. She didn't know if she could take it. And I asked her, do you love these kids? Do you truly love them? She sat there for the longest time, tears coming down her face. And I was thinking to myself, oh my goodness, if she says no, I'm in trouble. <laughs> but she was finally able to squeak out a yes. It wasn't very strong, but it was there. And I told her, if you love them, you're going to have to sacrifice for them. You're going to have to give to them what they don't want. Even if they don't even know they want it, you're going to have to give it to them and stand in their lives and be a pillar. That's hard. But that day, she made a conscious decision to withstand the pressures, to withstand the tribulation, withstand everything that was shoved in her face by those students. She made a decision to be a good teacher. We have that decision right now. I have that decision right now. To make a conscious decision to follow Christ, no matter where he leads me, to give my all, to stand in people's life and give them what they need in Christ Jesus. Can we stand together in unity and whatever comes our way? in the establishment of his kingdom upon the earth, that we would give thanks 
in gratitude for him standing next to us. For sending his power to be with us to overcome. That that kingdom would be built and established for all mankind. Can we do that this morning? I'll leave you with this scripture. From Doctrine and Covenants 108. It's the appendix to the book of commandments. Hearken and hear, O ye inhabitants of the earth. Listen, ye elders of my church together, and hear the voice of the Lord. For he calleth upon all men, and he commandeth all men everywhere to repent. For behold, the Lord hath sent forth the angel, crying through the midst of heaven, saying, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, and make his path straight. For the hour of his coming is nigh, when the Lamb shall stand upon Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty and four thousand, having his Father's names written in their foreheads. Wherefore, prepare ye for the coming of the bridegroom. Go ye, go ye out to meet him. For behold, he shall stand upon the Mount Olivet, and upon the mighty oceans, even the great deep, and upon the isles of the sea, and upon the land of Zion. And he shall utter his voice out of Zion, and he shall speak from Jerusalem, and his voice shall be heard among all people. And it shall be the voice as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, which shall break down the mountains, and the valley shall not be found. He shall command the great deep, and it shall be driven back to the north countries and the isles shall become one land and the land of Jerusalem and the land of Zion shall be turned back into their own place and the earth shall be like it was in the days it was divided and the Lord even the Savior shall stand in the midst of his people and shall reign over all flesh that's the promise that we have as saints of the most high God May we respond to him and give him thanks and praise through our obedience is my prayer in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this morning together in worship of Thee. 
we uh, approach this coming week recognizing that uh, we fall short in offering our thanks unto thee and so we pledge to uh, try to remember thee each day this coming week as we celebrate this holiday and we know that uh, around the corner we will be remembering the great condescension of thy son in coming to earth in the form of an infant and living into adulthood for we know that uh, he has experienced the things that we have experienced and truly he is our advocate with thee we pray uh, and thank thee for thy son and we thank thee for the gospel and for the purpose that it brings to our lives and we pray that as we go from here as we go in preparation that we will labor for that kingdom that uh, we might be thy people and bear our testimony of thy son and we pray these things in jesus name amen <laughs>